Hi right, friends, welcome back to another episode of Generation Films. My name is Alan. Last episode, we looked at the real size of some of the most iconic ships in science fiction films by comparing them to real life objects in our own world, ranging from giant buildings to giant ships. Today, we're going to expand on that by looking at the largest ships in science fiction films, because size matters. So the first ship we're going to be talking about today is also going to be the smallest one on our list, and ironically, it used to be the largest ship in the entire Star Wars franchise. We're talking about the Super Star Destroyer Executor Class, or Executor. Executor or Executor, it's like ATAT -AT or AT-AT, -AT. who knows. So the backbone of the Galactic Empire's navy was made up of the triangular-shaped Imperial-class Star Destroyers that we talked about in our last episode. These are 1.6-kilometer behemoths that were able to maintain control over entire systems and dozens of planets at the same time. The Galactic Empire had about 25,000 of these babies, but at the core of their fleet was the larger Super Star Destroyer class. There were more than a dozen confirmed SSDs and probably a few more that we don't even know about. This was a pretty secretive process, just like the Death Star, because at the time when the Empire started construction of these ships, the Senate had not been dissolved yet. So it was imperative to keep such large spending projects secretive. These gigantic vessels served as the flagships for Imperial VIPs or command ships for larger fleets of ISDs. The Executor Class Super Star Destroyer was the most common type of command ship. At 19 kilometers long, these ships were more like cities rather than just ships. They had a crew of over a quarter million people on board, including several legions of stormtroopers. And there was even an internal tram system known as the Beltway to serve the entire ship. Without it, it would take the average person well over three hours just to walk from one end of the ship to the other. And that's only if you have the proper clearance codes in your officer cylinder, or if you have really good plot armor. At 19 kilometers long, it was also almost as long as Manhattan Island. Now, the Executive Class Super Star Destroyer was not the only one in its class. There was also the Eclipse. This served as Emperor Palpatine's personal command ship. The Eclipse was around the same length as the Executor Class, but much larger in volume. In the universe of Dune, only the Space and Guild had the right to FTL travel, and that was an extremely dangerous right to have. The Guild in Dune folded time in order to shorten the distances between massive amounts of space. But this type of space folding was incredibly dangerous. One out of ten trips in space ended up with the loss of the ship. <laughs> Those are pretty terrible odds. Imagine if one out of ten subway train rides ended up in explosions. Well, actually, in New York City, if you take the subway after midnight on the weekends, well, you have a pretty good chance of seeing an explosion of bodily fluids. Anyway, the navigators in the Space Guild decreased the odds of death and explosion during FTL flight by heavily using spice. This is a pretty impressive drug that could give the user the power of foresight, which really was helpful when you're piloting a ship traveling at the speed of light and trying your best to avoid gravitational anomalies. It also made your eyes blue, but not in a nice way, but in a creepy way. And the Spacing Guild used Highliners, which were extremely long, cylindrical-shaped ships. Highliners were massive ships and could contain several small freighters and whatever other type of cargo you want to place on board. Like a giant sandworm. Most Highliners were over 20 kilometers long. One of the earliest movie-induced nightmares I've ever had was thanks to the film Independence Day, the real-life story of how America made July 4th an international holiday. And should we win the day? The 4th of July will no longer be known as an American holiday, but as the day when the world declared in one voice, we will not go quietly into the night. That night after the movie, I dreamt that my entire town was rounded up in one of the crappy strip malls in my town, and we were all executed. I specifically remember a harvester alien spitting acid at my chest and killing me. I was like 9 or 10 years old. Now, this is silly because harvesters don't spit acid. They have guns, and on top of that, they don't round up civilians in parking lots. They just blow up entire cities from outer space using city destroyers. These ships were enormous and didn't only destroy cities, but the dreams of human beings. And they were actually the size of cities themselves. At 25 kilometers in diameter, they had the surface area of 490 square kilometers. That's almost three times larger than the surface area of Washington, D.C. The harvester's tactics were pretty simple. They would deploy dozens of these ships to a new planet they were looking to exploit for natural resources, 
have them position themselves over major population centers, and then simultaneously fire their gigantic laser weapons at the ground, killing as many life forms as possible. After the first wave of attacks, they would rinse and repeat until all resistance is destroyed. Now, should the local inhabitants put up a fight, these ships also have deflector shields, which could shrug off a tactical nuke like it was nothing. They also had smaller fighter craft known as attackers that had their own shields. Now, next up, we jump back into the Star Wars franchise. Remember how I said that the Executor class Super Star Destroyer used to be the largest ship in Star Wars? Well, that's because of this ship, the Supremacy. The Supremacy was the flagship of the First Order Fleet and Supreme Burn Victim Snoke. This massive ship was 60.5 kilometers wide and over 13 kilometers long, and it kind of looks like a gigantic version of the B-2 Stealth Bomber. Now you're probably thinking to yourself, oh, here we go again, Disney has run out of ideas, so the First Order is just a larger version of everything the Empire has built. Which makes sense, you have Starkiller Base, which obviously is Disney trying to one-up the Death Star, the Resurgence Class Star Destroyer, which is just a larger version of the Imperial Class Star Destroyer, then there's the Gorilla Walker, which is just the bigger version of the AT-AT. But the Supremacy actually has a pretty good reason for being humongous. You see, when the Imperial Remnant escaped after the Battle of Jakku into the Unknown Region, they started building their forces in secret. It was imperative that the New Republic never found out about their true strength until they were ready to return back to the core of the galaxy to claim what rightfully was theirs in the first place. For this reason, the headquarters of the First Order was kept mobile on the Supremacy. It made it easier for the First Order to defend and keep out of sight of sneaky New Republic and Resistance soldiers. And even though it was a starship, it basically had everything you really needed to run an empire. There were over 2 million crew members and soldiers on board, along with several large bays that could serve as staging areas or even repair hangars for ships as large as the Resurgence class Star Destroyer, which themselves were almost 3 kilometers long. This all was powered by 6 fusion reactors, which in turn powered 32 sublight engines, several factories, foundries, laboratories, training bases, and at least one Cold Stone Creamery. The Supremacy was actually more like a giant space station or a small moon or planetoid rather than a ship. But what was the most impressive part of the Supremacy? Well, it was able to withstand the ultimate road rage incident caused by resistance terrorist Admiral Holdo. Not many things can survive a collision with a middle-aged purple-haired lady who is completely pissed off at you and going at FTL speeds. Now, we can't really talk about giant sci-fi ships without mentioning the other Star franchise, Star Trek. The Federation's more peaceful nature meant that they didn't normally waste gigantic amounts of resources building enormous ships, but there was one ship, well, actually probe, that is definitely large enough to make it as number three on our list of largest sci-fi ships. We're talking about the Whale Probe from Star Trek The Voyage Home. In this timeline of Earth in the 23rd century, all whales have gone extinct, admittedly most likely caused by us. By us, I mean Generation Tech and Generation Film fans. Uh, by the end of the 21st century, actually, our fan base militarizes due to the rising sea levels, which have caused the whales and dolphins to carry out attacks on human land. It was a bloody mess. You see, you guys, what we didn't realize when we were killing the last humpback whale enemy combatant was that a few hundred years later, massive cylinders would appear over the earth and demand to talk to these whales, specifically the humpbacks, or else they would destroy the earth. It was a serious enough threat that Captain Kirk actually decides to go back in time to grab one of these whales in order to save the day. The whale probe was massive at 74 kilometers in length, probably far bigger than anything a Federation ship could destroy. Our second largest ship can actually hold dozens of another ship on our list. We're talking about, of course, the mothership from Independence Day. It could hold dozens of city destroyers. These massive ships were 596 kilometers in length and 550 kilometers in width, which is roughly around the size of Poland or Italy. During the War of 1996, the mothership hid behind the moon and directed all city destroyer operations. All the alien ships were tethered to this mothership and depended on it for its deflector shields. And fortunately for us, the aliens, when they were setting up their computers, forgot to create a guest login without admin privileges, which is how Jeff Goldman was able to hack into their system and plant a virus. Although mother ships had deflector shields, it couldn't handle a nuke being detonated from within. Sequels who don't have any new ideas usually just aim to make things bigger. That's what happened in the disappointing Independence Day resurgence. Instead of having a mothership, we have the Harvester mothership. 
What made this ship different from the last one was that there was a Harvester Queen on board. The Harvester Mothership is several times larger than the smaller Mothership at 5,000 kilometers in diameter. That is larger than the diameter of Mercury. This is an impressive ship and it had its own atmosphere created by large agricultural works. It had an extremely powerful shield that couldn't be penetrated by any Earthling weapons or any of the reverse engineered Harvester weapons we created as well. It also had a huge mining drill which the aliens used to dig a hole to the core of the planet where they were extracting the molten core. Because the ship was so massive in size, when it landed, the gravity of the ship destroyed most of the east coast of America as well as the west coast of Europe. So guys, those are the largest ships in science fiction. And wow, some of these designs are just amazing. 5,000 kilometers in diameter. I can't even wrap my head around how big that actually is. Unfortunately, right now here on Earth, we don't have the resources, willpower, technology to create something like that. We can't be consumed by our petty differences anymore. What if one day humanity could finally unite together? We will be united in our common interests. Forget about all of our cultural, political, and religious differences. And you will once again be fighting for our freedom. Not from tyranny, oppression, or persecution. But from creating a human empire. And should we win the day? An empire in which every human being can enjoy the best that life has to offer, thanks to alien slave labor. That's that humanity first. Well, guys, don't forget to subscribe, hit that notification button so you don't miss out on the rest of our awesome content. For all of you guys out there celebrating Hanukkah, happy Hanukkah. For the rest of you, I hope you're enjoying this December and holiday season. Well, guys, my name is Alan, reminding you that life is a movie and you guys are the protagonist.